Hi. Oh, brilliant. That means it's time to start. My favorite bit. Um, so hi, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, welcome to my talk on property-based testing. First of all, like, thank you all for coming. And thank you to NDC Oslo for having me. Um, all pictures, images are either mine or from the PowerPoint stock library, which, by the way, if you haven't explored, is fantastic. Um, so in case we haven't met, which I'm assuming is everyone here, um, my name is Lucy. That is a picture of me on a good day. This is me on a Thursday. Um, so my preferred pronouns are she slash they. Um, I'm a senior software developer at a company called Kodat. So uh, we build financial integrations, financial software integrations. If you're in the market for financial software integrations, like come hit me up. Um, I currently work in front-end land, so TypeScript, React, Svelte, um, but I have a background as a .NET developer. I used to do Angular, unfortunately, but fortunately I don't anymore. Um, I love functional programming. I love F Sharp. Um, I run the F Sharp group at Kodak. We won't talk about how active it is. It's everyone else's fault, not mine. Um, also, in case you can't tell from my accent, I am from London in the UK. Um, so if you want to talk to me about non-technical things, so I like making things, um, mostly knitting myself hats and scarves that are ridiculous and huge, because why not? Um, I like sewing things. I recently made this jacket and skirt, which I'm particularly proud of. Um, I love making PowerPoints. Um, I think I might have actually discovered all the features of PowerPoint and might have actually reached the perf performance limitations of it. So we'll see how this goes. Um, I went to RuPaul's DragCon UK earlier this year, and I met Lawrence Cheney, if anyone likes drag queens. And um, I went to Svalbard last year, and I saw a polar bear, and I definitely took that photo. It definitely didn't steal it from the stock image library. Um, so somebody who is cleverer than me was like, you should put the conclusion at your start of your PowerPoint so everyone knows what you're going to talk about. So property-based testing is a technique for testing statements of the type for all x that satisfy some precondition, then some predicate holds. Um, it can give you the confidence that your code behaves correctly across a wide range of inputs. It can help you find bugs in your code from inputs that you may have never even thought to test. And this technique can be used alongside existing unit tests. So um, thank you very much for coming to my talk. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, um, that is not the end of the presentation. Uh, let's actually get into it. So question, uh, show of hands. I promise I will not pick on you. I just want a show of hands. Who here knows what property-based testing is? Oh, dear, a few of you actually know. That means I can't just lie for an hour. Oh, well. Um, let's get into it. Let's talk about reversing a list. Um, let's pretend you're a junior. This is you. You're a cat for some reason. Don't ask me. Um, we're going to use F sharp, functional programming, test driven development, all good stuff. So I'm going to be like, here is your function signature. Who here actually knows F sharp? A couple of hands, fantastic. Well, uh, just so you're not this cat in the corner going, ah, let's just quickly go through the syntax. So first of all, we are going to define a function called list reverse. Um, I apologize for my GPU. It's really struggling with these animations, but bear with me. So yes, we're defining a function. We're calling it list reverse. This takes a single argument, which is a list of integers. It returns a list of integers, preferably reversed, but we'll get onto that. And the implementation will go here. So it's not that scary. So how should we approach implementing this function? You might be like, let's just jump in and write a list reverse function. I remember how to write one of those when I went to university all those years ago. But no, we like test-driven development. So we are going to write the unit tests first. Here's what a unit test looks like in F-sharp. So uh, here's a bit of time to read the slide, and I can have a drink. Right, I hope you read the slide and didn't just watch the um, line going across the screen, because I definitely did. Um, again, let's just walk through the bits so we're not a scared little kitty in the corner. Come on. Come on. There we go. So using n unit and f unit, fs unit, pretty standard like testing library stuff. Uh, you can use any unit test framework of choice. 
Um, our test is called can reverse list. Um, for anyone who cares, technically, this is a variable name in F sharp that has spaces in, which is kind of cool. Um, then we write our test setup code, which is let's take a list, let's pass it into our list reverse function, and then let's assert that the reverse list should equal three, two, one. Um, and yes, F sharp does use semicolon as a list delimiter. Don't ask me why. Also, don't worry about that funny pointy symbol. We're not going to worry about that. So, not so scary. Let's run our test. Fails as we expect. You know, it goes, oh, no, there's no implementation. Um, let's also chuck in an edge case test that empty list returns an empty list. Fantastic. So, next, let's implement. How do we implement this function? I will give you a bit of time to think. So the answer is, of course, this. I'm hearing a few giggles. I'm assuming those are the F sharpers. Um, if we just go translate this, so the answer is, if the list we're given is 1, 2, 3, then return 3, 2, 1. Otherwise, return an empty list. It's perfect, right? Yeah, it is perfect. Passes our, our um, unit test. Everything's green. So you know now it's time to take a nap and prepare our letter asking for a promotion to senior level, because we're really good. Um, a few minutes later. Um, I come along and I try and use this function and I say, oh, okay, let's try and reverse list 678. And it tells me, oh, the reverse of 678 is, of course, an empty list. And I'm just like, oh my God, why is this function not working as I expect? So I do the natural thing. I say, okay, it's not working as I expect. Let's add a new test case. Test case fails. I give it back to you to fix. And what do you do? Well, you just do that. Um, you just add a new case to say, oh, if you're given 678, then return 876. Passes the unit test. Everything's green. Everything's good, right? Test-driven development. And you're probably sat there going, oh my god, come on, Lucy. Like, this is, this is ridiculous. No one would do this. Um, and then I'm like, aha. I'm a software developer, so I'm going to very jankily convince you this is, in fact, a very logical thing to do. So let's hop on over to our best friend, Wikipedia. Uh, this is the page for test-driven development. Um, let's just zoom in on step number three, which is write the simplest code that passes the new test. So you're given a load of tests. You have to write the simplest code that passes the new tests. Let's say, for example, you didn't know it was a list reversal function. You were just given this set of test cases for a mystery function, and you had to write something that passes the test cases. And it's like, what, what would be your implementation? What is the most logical implementation in this case? Unfortunately, the simplest code that passes this is a match statement. So. I'm doing test-driven development. That's my implementation. It works. So in order to fully specify the reversal function, we could add more test cases. Um, I don't know how many possible integer lists there are representable on a 64-bit machine. But I'm assuming it's a very large number. No one has actually told me what the number is. So if you know, then let me know. Um, so, yeah, I could add a huge number of test cases. You can just go ahead and add more cases to the match statement. And um, the, I'll just put this here. <laughs> Clearly, it's not the right approach. And let's just take a step back. Let's think, how do we actually define what a function is? Like, if you had to describe what list reversal was, like, how do you describe that? You could kind of say, let's define its behavior. Let's say, oh, OK, well, I take a list, and I'll rearrange it to be backwards, right? 
that's list reversal. But then the kind of issue is, all I've done here is I've described reversal with a synonym of reverse. Like reverse means backwards, backwards means reverse. I'm not actually describing what is reversal. I'll give you a few seconds just to think. Like if you were describing to an alien, for some reason understood your native language perfectly, but didn't understand the concept of reversing a list, like how would you describe it to them? So one way we can describe a function is we can identify some properties of the function. So property is something that is, for all x, satisfies some precondition, some predicate holds. What properties can we define for list reversal? Well, one thing we can say is if you take any list, reverse it twice, you get the same thing back. Now, you can say that for any function. If you just take a list and just return the list, then that's going to hold. So what else can we say? Oh, we can say if it's a non-empty list, the first item in the reverse list will be the last item in the resulting list. We can also say the opposite. The last item in the original list becomes the first item in your output list. You can say, oh, if I have a list that's a palindrome, Reversing does nothing. So a palindrome is a list that's the same backwards as it is forwards. So reversing that gives you the same thing. Um, I'm sure there's a few more things. Um, you know, exercise for the reader, AKA, I was too lazy to write more in this slide, but uh, you get the point, you know? So how does this help us? We can't exhaustively test every single input to our function. What we could do is we could actually write, oh my god, God, that is terrible. We could write a mathematical proof. Um, question, has anyone ever done a mathematical proof their code is correct? Couple of hands, I'm not entirely sure why you would do that. I personally, I'm not an academic. There's a reason why I'm a software developer, not a you know, researcher. Uh, I kind of don't care. Um, I also like writing code rather than writing proofs. So to me, like writing a mathematical proof is like not the one. So this is where, surprise of the century, we're going to talk about property-based testing. So what is property-based testing? Well, surprisingly, it's when you use properties to test your functions. Properties, once again, for all x that satisfy some precondition, some predicate holds. So, for example, a uh, property of a integer list reversal function is, given a list of integers, if I reverse it twice, I get the original list. Um, this will hold for a generic list, just for the sake of simplicity in this talk, I'm going to talk about integer lists, uh, just because. <laughs> Let's have a look at a library called fscheck. So fscheck is a .NET library. The fs in fscheck stands for f -sharp, but it's a .NET library. You can use it for C -sharp. You can use it for any .NET language. So I think in Visual Basic still around. You can use this in Visual Basic, but I think you've got bigger problems. Um, I will go on to this later, but there are language, there are libraries for every single language you would want. Anyway. Let's have a look at fscheck. What does a test in fscheck look like? Look something like this. Neat, huh? Hmm. I think so, but let's just go through it. First of all, I write a function that specifies the property. So I always call this check function because I'm an incredibly creative individual. There we go. Next, I specify what to do to actually like no, I specify what we're given as an argument to check function. So, you know, I'm given a list of integers. So the argument to my check function is a list of integers. I then specify how to manipulate the inputs. In this case, I am reversing it twice. So I pass it into the F sharp list reversal function twice. I'm using the F sharp standard library rather than our list reverse function because reasons. And then I assert using standard library function. So in this case, I'm checking, I get the original list. This is using um, an FS 
unit equality, deep equality check. It's read as it's written. This is the reason why I used F sharp. And then I just tell FS check to run the property using check.quick. And I run it. There we go. I run it. I get a green tick, and I'm like, cool, I can move on with my life. Um, let's just have a quick look at what it's actually doing under the hood, because, I mean, I haven't actually explained anything yet. Uh, you might have noticed here it says, OK, past 100 tests. So what it's actually doing under the hood, let's just say, oh, let's log out whatever inputs we get to that function. So you can see the inputs it's generating. Here, so basically, it runs your function multiple times, randomly generated inputs. The inputs start small, and they get bigger as the test runs progress. So when I say small, there is a definition for what small means, but you know, intuitively, start small gets big. Um, it will try to generate inputs that try to find edge cases as quickly as possible. So in this case, it starts with an empty list. Then it'll start with a list with zero. Then it'll start with, you know, it'll start generating really, really big lists. If you're starting with numbers, it would start with like zero, infinity, negative infinity, the smallest possible number representable in your number system of choice. You know, those kind of obscure things maybe you wouldn't have thought to test. So one thing might be helpful is to say, oh, well, what happens if it fails? So let's write a test that says, oh, reversing list gives the original list. As I said before, this will only work for palindromic lists, lists that are the same backwards as they are forwards. Uh, you know, I'm there being like, oh, it won't work for non-palindromic lists. So let's run it, get a red cross, fantastic. Let's inspect the output. What it tells us is, the first input it generated that caused the failure, in this case, it's a list 0, 2. So, you know, it tried an empty list. Empty list worked. Tried a list with one element. That worked. Tried a list with two elements. That didn't work. It then does something kind of cool called shrinking, which attempts to give you, like, a minimal input that causes a failure. In this case, you know, a list of 0 and 1. Um, shrinking is an actual thing. I won't go into it. But, yeah, neat. Basically, oh, no, I wanted to go back that way. Thank you. Um, what you can do at this point when you see this failure is you can go into your unit, into your code, and you can say, OK, I'm going to run it with this example, 0 and 1. I'm going to debug my code and figure out why is this not working as I expected. And then you can go, neat, I found my edge case, or the thing where it's wrong. So I'm sure you think that this is the most wonderful technique, and you can't wait to use it. So I appreciate that. Uh, writing a list reversal function and showing that it's possibly correct maybe isn't the most useful thing. So let's just have a look at a few cases you might want to use it where I personally have used property-based testing in the past. So scenario number one, if there's some randomness inherent in your code. Um, an example where I use this, um, I had a list of integers. It wasn't integers, but I had a list of integers. I had a function where I wanted to take a single element randomly from that list and return the original list. So the question is, how would you unit test this? It's random. You expect to get a different answer back every single time. And what you could do is you could say, oh, OK, well, we're going to pass in a seed number to seed our random. And then if you have the same seed, you always get the same random output. So you're kind of fixing the randomness that way. But then it's like, yeah, but how many seed values are you going to test? How do you know you haven't just happened to pick the correct seed value that has the right behavior? How do you test this? And actually, property-based testing like, comes in really great here. So say I've got this implementation, remove random. Um, it takes a list of integers, and it returns two values, a single integer, which is our remove value, and the list, the remaining items. And we can write a property-based test for this based on the property 
of if I take that single removed element and the rest of that list, the remaining elements, if I smash them together, I get the original list. This should work regardless of which random element, which element is randomly chosen. So this is what the tests look like. Let's just go through it quickly. So um, yeah, remove random, concatenating the results gives the original list. We take in a list. We're going to just ignore empty lists. This function fails for empty lists because reasons, um, simplicity. So we take the two return, return values, the item removed, and the remaining items in the list. We concatenate them using this fancy F sharp uh, cons operator to combine it into a list. And then we just say, yeah, take that reconstructed list, assert that it is equivalent to, so same items, possibly different order, assert it's equivalent to the original list. And there we go. We've written a unit test in however many lines that is. I didn't add in the line numbers because I'm very helpful. We've written a unit test that reliably tests our function that is random without having to take the randomness out of it. Another place you might want to use it is when the solution is easy to verify but hard to prove. So let's say, for example, you are writing your own sorting function for reasons unknown to me. Um, it's a nice example in this case. That's why we're doing it. How do you prove a sorting algorithm works? Like, proving sorting algorithms work is like really hard, and I don't like doing that kind of hard proofs. I don't even know if that's possible. I'm kind of making this up. Again, I'm a programmer, not an academic. But also I realize I'm a programmer, not an academic. And as long as it like works well enough for me, that's good enough for me. So one thing, we can change tack. We can say, oh, well, it's easy to verify a list is sorted. We can just go through pairwise, compare each element, and check, oh, is that sorted? So. A property-based test will look something like this. We can say, oh, given a random list, sort it with my special sort function, generate all the pairs with this list.pairwise function. So as an example, given the list 0, 1, 2, 3, it generates 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, possibly as you'd expect. I hope so, anyway. And then go through each pair, check it's in order. And now, I haven't proved my list is sorting correctly, but if I run it with 100 lists and I find those lists are all sorted, I can be like, oh, that's good enough for me. I mean, that chicken's meant to be shaking, going, wow, look how cool I am. But um, apparently not today. I do apologize. Scenario number three. Um, this one might be possibly the best case to use it. Um, if you have an existing implementation to compare against, property-based testing is just fantastic. Let's say you're in the case where you've got a legacy function and you need to refactor it to a nice new version. And you're like, well, do I really have to go through and like find all the edge cases and make sure I've captured all the edge case behavior? And it's like, no, you don't. Actually, you can just say property-based testing. You can say, oh, just generate random inputs for me, pass it into both functions, check it's the same. And it's like, I have written a property-based test in five lines that should capture every single edge case. And I don't have to go through. And I have done this before. And it found like three edge cases that I'd missed. I'm like, oh, good. Good, now I won't have those bug tickets further down the line. Um, I think this is the reason why my laptop is struggling so much. I found out, sorry, bit of an aside. I found out PowerPoint has a fantastic library of 3D models, including an animated juggling octopus. Because reasons. <laughs> Um, so scenario number four, um, you've got forward and reverse functions. Um, so if you're me and you're really bored one day, you might go, oh, I know what's fun to do. I'm going to write some custom serializers and deserializers for my objects. Because reasons, um, COVID was a really boring time for all of us. Um, again, property-based testing, you can say, oh, OK, just generate some random input for my serializer function 
serialize it, deserialize it, check I've got the same object. It's brilliant. <laughs> I've done this before. I was writing custom serializers. Don't ask me why. Um, I ran into an issue where if I added an optional field to my object, that wouldn't be a compiler error because it's an optional field. I forgot to add it to the serializer. So if I had had standard unit tests that said, oh, here's an object, serialize it, deserialize it, check it's the same, that would have been like, oh, yeah, this is fine because it wouldn't have had the optional field. But property-based testing generates those optional fields for me, and then it breaks and it goes like, oh, save me hours. Scenario number five, which is, um, so I showed this talk to my company, and this is the one they latched onto the best. Um, so this one, oh, there we go, it's on the screen now. And the nuclear finding option, nuclear exception finding option, literally run your code and make sure there's no exceptions. Uh, generate inputs, run it, check there's no exceptions. It's so simple. But adding this, you might find places where there's exceptions, and you might go, uh, uh, maybe I should make it handle null things because I'm not using a strict null checking language. That kind of thing, you know? Um, oh, no. Sorry. Last scenario. I have lost count. One place you might want to find, might find use in it, is when only part of the range of possible outputs is valid. Um, so sometimes... This might sound weird. Sometimes it's very useful to verify your solution is not wrong rather than it's right. An example for this is like just check that the value should be always positive. Check it shouldn't be null. Check that it's like it might not be the right number, but I know it's at least not the wrong number. Let's say you've, you're writing an absolute function. So given any number, find the absolute value. So the absolute value of 7 is 7. Absolute value of minus 5 is 5. So you know for an absolute function, the output should always be positive. And if you're relying on that behavior, put it in a test. If it forms part of your specification, put it in a test. So. This is all cool, but has anyone actually used this in real life? The answer is yes, they have. Um, so I did this talk at my company. I had a quick look in my company's code base for references to FS check about a year ago, and I found 74 code references, which means somebody else in the company called Richard Sanderson Pope uh, was like, yeah, this tool is really useful. This is before I even yelled about it in front of my company. And then, after I gave this talk, 129 references. I have single-handedly increased the number of property-based tests in my company by 50%, and I'm a bit scared, if I'm honest. Ooh. Um, so here, JavaScript devs, you are not safe either. I know I've been talking about FS check and C Sharp and .NET and stuff, but actually, as I will touch on later, you can do this in any language you choose. Uh, JavaScript, TypeScript have this lovely library called FastCheck. They have got a really cool page called Issues Found, where they document issues they have found, surprisingly enough, in quite big libraries. So who here has used Jest to unit test on the front end? Not many hands. I'm assuming you're mostly back end then. Basically, Jest is used for every single React app for testing. And FastCheck found this issue where to strict equals fails to distinguish 0 from 5 times 10 to the minus 324. An obvious test case, right? Uh, for those curious, 5 times 10 to the minus 324 is number dot minimum. It's like the minimum smallest possible positive number that you can represent. It's not a nice number like 2 times 10 to the minus 64 or something. It's like some weird number. I don't know why. But yeah, obvious thing to test for, right? Another thing is to equal is not symmetric for set. Um, I haven't exactly... I've seen this a couple of times. I don't exactly know what's happening, but it's not the kind of thing that I'd sit there and go, oh, this is a really obvious test case that I must test for. That a true is not equal to like a new Boolean of true or... <laughs> Obviously. 
And um, as I said, you can do it in any language you want. If you just Google property-based testing, my favorite language. Um, so there's Hypothesis for Python, QuickTrack for Haskell, which I believe was the OG property-based testing library, jQuick for Java, QuickCheck for Rust, PropCheck for Ruby, Theft for C, if for some reason you're still using C and you're like, oh, I must do property-based testing. Um, there's Eris for PHP, Rapid for Go. Um, I think you get the idea. Uh, the one language I have checked for that doesn't have property-based testing is BrainFuck, and I think if you're using BrainFuck, you've got other problems. But so let's just go over like I've given this talk a couple of times. Here's some questions I've been asked before. Um, so can I use this for complex types? Like, cool, testing on integer lists is really fun and all, but we don't use integer lists IRL. And the answer is yes, with a big asterisk, which stands for, um, yes, you can, but your ease of doing it depends on your language and framework of choice. So fscheck.net land, um, it's great for this. Um, because you've got, oh, let's say as an example, I'm writing this physics simulation. I've got some nested objects, um, tuples, that kind of thing. Um, basically, if I put this as an argument into a property-based test, FS check, because it's .NET, because you've got runtime types, it can inspect this type and it can figure out with some magical reflection stuff, how do I actually make a, whatever that type is called, a moving item? And it kind of reverse engineers it and generates things for you. And you, if we just inspect what it's actually generating for us, you might look at that and think, huh. Some of those numbers are a bit funny. I don't think an object can have a weight of negative infinity, though I'm not sure. So what is actually quite interesting about this, if you think about your semantics of what you're saying in your type definition, you're saying this can be any double, which means technically, if you're saying, oh, my weight is negative infinity, that's Fine, that's valid according to your model. Like, it's not, but it is. Um, so, this is kind of where maybe your type should actually be reflecting your real world a bit more. So, maybe you should say, ah, oh, well, the weight isn't a double. The weight has to be, say, a positive number, at least like between one and a hundred, say. But property based testing will generate whatever. You can tell it to not generate whatever, but then you can have, you have to be mindful that actually your test isn't covering that entire range of inputs. You're actually only testing a specific range of inputs. You have to be mindful if you're trying to use this code outside of that range of inputs. Um, it kind of looks a bit silly, but if you're using doubles, it should work for negative infinity. Um, let's look at the same in JavaScript slash TypeScript. So, um, well, TypeScript. Um, this is not so good. So one of the, um, let's say I'm using TypeScript. I've got my interface. One big issue with TypeScript interfaces is uh, they're compile time only. So at runtime, this is just an object. You know, there's nothing to inspect to figure out that, oh, I need to have a position with two numbers in. It's just an object. So what you have to do in fast track is you have to kind of re essentially rewrite your interface using these like FC things to basically say, ah, this is how you would generate this object at runtime. Um, here's a bit of time to read the slide. So doing this for every single object that you want to add in can be a bit onerous. Um, I have had uh, a bit of like experimenting with like schema validation libraries and reverse engineering those to generate like a runtime type generator, I guess, but haven't used that in production yet. So interesting idea, but I haven't done it yet. So yes, can I use this for complex types? Yes, but nah, it depends. Um, question I got asked loads of time, I'm using F sharp, is can I use this with C sharp? Yes, F sharp, C sharp, you can use them interchangeably, they're both .NET, both compiled down to missile. This is what it looks like. It doesn't look as nice. 
it's kind of a bit janky. You're kind of you're not reading from top to bottom as much anymore. You're kind of having to do stuff. I don't know. Maybe I'm incredibly biased because I don't like C sharp and I love F sharp. But um, um, next question is: Are there any performance implications? To which the answer is yes, no, sort of. It depends on what you mean by performance. Um, so. One really unfortunate uh, thing of the rule of, uh, rule of the universe is like do more stuff means it takes more time. So FS checks running your test 100 times, so it's going to take a bit longer. Um, there we go. Should it take 100 times as long? Um, this is where I'm probably going to sound like a complete idiot in front of you. Um, I don't actually know how test runners work under the hood. Uh, mostly because I don't really care how test runners work under the hood. As long as they work, that's fine by me. So if we have our traditional unit test, you know, test true is equal to true. Um, let's have an equivalent property-based test, which is generate a number and check that number is equal to itself. Let's pit them against each other, see what happens. Um, so I run it in VS Code. And this is the output. So traditional unit test takes nine seconds, property-based test 242 sec uh, milliseconds, sorry. And it's like, that's not a factor of 100, even though it's running at 100 times. Even weirder, here it says it ran 20 tests in 813 milliseconds. And if you expand it, um, it shows that only the first one actually took any time at all to run. So I have a feeling something funny is happening on, in Visual Studio's <laughs> test runner. But the point I'm trying to make is I don't really care. It's a difference of milliseconds. Um, I spend way more time getting coffee than uh, 200 milliseconds, so that's fine by me. Um, this is a bit of an aside. On the topic of performance, just the time it takes to run your code isn't the only factor. So you've broadly got three categories of errors. You've got compiler errors, so that's when your types are wrong, for example, your syntax is wrong. Runtime errors, where uh, you've got some, something happening at runtime, say your value is null and you're trying to dereference it, you get a null reference exception. And logic errors, where the code runs fine, but it gives the wrong answers. So compiler errors are the easiest thing to identify and fix, and logic errors are the hardest to identify and fix. Logic errors are normally someone looking at the output and going, something seems a bit wrong. So. I'll admit, I'm a front-end developer. I work in TypeScript. I absolutely love the TypeScript compiler. I think the typing system is fantastic and the best thing that ever happened. Um, I would like people to come up and tell me I'm wrong so I can show them that they are wrong. Anyway, um, so let's say I've got a function, takes two inputs, and my specification for my input is, oh, well, you can give either neither of the arguments or both of the arguments. So I write my function, I say, oh, if, if, if I'm only given one, then throw. OK, that's fine. Have a bit of time to read the slide. So I can call my function like this. I can call it with nothing, one argument or two arguments. Um, TypeScript's like, yeah, this is, this is fine. This is fine. This is great. Um, of course. I would have to write uh, unit tests that say, oh, if you're given in the, in the second case, when you're given one thing, just check that it throws. I have to write a unit test for that. I don't like writing, writing unit tests. What I can do instead is I can say, oh, how can I shove this from a runtime error into a compiler error? And I can actually do something quite fancy. I can group up my arguments and say, oh, if you give me nothing, or you give me an object containing both the arguments. So now I have to call it like this, so I can say my func but better with no arguments, or my func but better with an object containing two arguments. And what happens if I try to call it with one argument? Well, TypeScript kind of turns around and goes, no, 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 Lucy, no, you can't do that. That's naughty. You need to have both of them. And why am I covering this? Well. I don't need to write a unit test for this case. Compiler catches it, so I like my compiler. I rely on my compiler a lot. I don't have to write a unit test for this. The best code is no code, so the fastest test is no test at all. 
So actually taking the time to like shove your errors from runtime into compiler errors is so helpful and can really help you with performance. So it's kind of neat that the compiler can do this. Um, is it more or less performant? I kind of don't care. I'm working in JavaScript. I've got bigger issues. Um, I care more about the readability and the intent that I'm carrying, like that I'm like saying, oh, you have to have both or neither. That's it. Nothing else. Shorting that feedback loop so someone else using my code is aware that they have to have both of them is more important to me than wasting potentially milliseconds. Um, unfortunately, one of the uh, terrible truths about life is that not everything can be caught by compiler error. Sometimes you have to deal with runtime errors, and that's kind of what testing is for, really. It's for, those, it's for testing, catching those runtime errors. So testing pyramid, I'm sure you're all aware. Every single person draws it differently. Every single person has a different number of steps and a different number of things, but this is my one. So you've got the lowly unit test at the bottom, so testing a function, uh, a single function on its own. Then you've got integration tests, so this might be testing an entire, for example, UI. Um, checking it renders correctly, checking that the buttons work correctly, checking the API calls being made correctly, but mocking out all of those API calls. So it's the entire UI, but by itself. And then end-to-end -end tests, which are, you know, testing your service in a live environment with like other services and databases and all that kind of nastiness that happens. And yeah, um, my testing pyramid though has got the compiler at the bottom because I believe that. Actually, the compiler, like using that effectively, is the most important thing about a testing pyramid, but maybe that's just me. Um, point I want to make is property based testing lives here, lives in the unit test area. It's for you could do it higher up. One of the nice things about unit tests is they're small and quick to run, therefore, running them 100 times is okay. End to end tests might take in the order of minutes to run, so running them 100 times is um, that is problematic to me. So let's just talk about deployment writing code. First of all, I write my code with my best buddy, which is, of course, the compiler. Next, I raise a PR, get it merged, main, send it off to a build server. Then I deploy it out to test, check everything's running there, nothing's on fire. Then I just chuck it out to production and you know, hope that nothing is on fire and they haven't caused a prod outage again. Um, so property-based testing can help you catch errors on this side. Uh, you know, when I'm working with my compiler or I'm building my code, before they can cause issues on the prod side. So to me, the performance of my tests, I'm not too concerned about. I'd rather my test took a few extra seconds to run than having a P1 bug or an outage or something like that, because that takes a few more seconds to... Um, to resolve and isn't good for my stress levels. So the headline figure of like property-based testing being 30 times slower can be really scary, but in the long run, doesn't matter. Um, so does test suite performance really matter? Just to contradict myself, maybe. Um, if you go, wow, I love property-based testing so much, I'm going to go out and change everything tomorrow to be property-based tests. And you're like, hey, Lucy, why is my test suddenly taking like 30 minutes to run instead of one minute? And I'm like, oh, dear, I'm so sorry. So this gets on to the next question, which is, when shouldn't I use property-based testing? Um, and I know you're probably sat there going, oh, my baby, my lovely baby. Uh, I don't kind of want you to look back a few years' time and be like, oh, I remember when I thought you were cool, and now I'm like, I hate you. Um, no one's ever done that, right? <laughs> Um, so yeah, when shouldn't you use it? You shouldn't use it if you don't have standard unit tests. Like a unit test, like take the list one, two, three, reverse it, and you get three, two, one. That is so easy to understand. It's easy to debug. It's so useful just to have that single example to say, oh, that's what that does. Don't use it if standard unit tests are sufficient. So one example you might have with an with an integer list, there's a very, very large number of lists possible. Let's say you're using an enum. 
well, you know that there's going to be like only a handful of cases, like four or five. So just exhaustively test every case. Uh, don't use it if you want to test a specific case. This might seem a bit obvious, but if you have a specific edge case, to test that specific edge case. Um, shouldn't use it if you can't identify suitable properties. So one of the hardest things about property-based testing is actually figuring out what are my properties. Um, properties can be hard to identify, but it is a very useful exercise to go through and try and identify them. And you should not use property-based testing if your models are not suitable. So let's say in that example with the moving item object where it was generating things of like negative infinity weight, if I'm trying to add property-based testing into that code base and I'd look at that and I go, oh, well, these models are not technically correct. Like it's generating junk data and you have to go through and filter out that junk data. And then you spend so long basically reverse engineering your code generation to kind of write unit tests that work properly. And then you have tests that are more complex than the code you're testing. And then it's like, who tests the unit tests? So if you don't have suitable models, actually generating your uh, things can be very, uh, coming up with suitable properties can be very difficult. Um, but yes, you'll be glad to know that I'm pretty much done talking now. Uh, so in conclusion, hopefully you remember this an hour ago. Property-based testing is a technique for testing statements of the type. For all x that satisfy some precondition, some predicate will hold. It can give you confidence that your code behaves correctly across a wide range of inputs. It can help you find bugs in your code resulting from inputs you never would have thought to test. And finally, this technique can and should be used alongside existing unit tests. Um, you can start using this tomorrow, but I'm sure you'll probably be busy at the conference, so maybe next week. Um, and with that, I will say thank you very much for listening.